<laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'm Justin Perni. Thank you for returning to our weekly webinar. Grateful that you continue to return to everyone who's new. Uh, welcome. If you are new, our goal is to provide as much value as we can every week through our nonprofit prison professors. I run White Collar Advice along with my team, and we have the nonprofit prison professors that uh, generates this webinar and plethora of, of resources that we give away to you. The, the goal of this webinar is to teach you the importance of self-advocacy. We can't uh, change that you're here. We can't change the past. We can't change that many of you are going to federal prison. What we can do is try to change the narrative and the way you approach every step in this process. To that end, we're going to continue today with steps six through 10 in our preparing to self-surrender uh, checklist. And I would like to, to open it. Frankly, it's a subject we haven't covered. You know, I joke with Ron when I saw I had dinner with him in Atlanta because Ron's been out for a while and he's attended so many of the webinars. He's like, you've covered some of these subjects. I'm like, yes, we need to cover preparing for prison and disciplinary infractions and advocacy and all of these things. But it's nice actually to touch on a subject that has really yet to be covered. And when I sent out to the announcement yesterday, I got 10 or 15 messages from people in our community who said, I can't attend the webinar, I'll watch the recording, or in the future, I'd love to contribute. Ryan, for example, texted, I went to a prison with a nine and 13 year old, and it was very difficult. And a lot of people had said, in retrospect, they could have handled that process a little bit differently. But the way they tell children, I have, I'll offer some insights on the way that, that I have gone about it over the years with certain clients. Uh, but of course, I want to learn uh, from all of you. And the idea stemmed from, uh, frankly, a, a series of frantic phone calls I received yesterday from someone who was home from prison. <laughs> really struggling, really unhappy. And he just wanted to vent and I listened and he spoke at length about the pain of going to prison with uh, twin young boys and just how devastating that was for him. And he never really gained traction in prison because of that separation. The consequence of that, please everyone, if you can mute yourself or Scott, if you can mute them. Thank you. The I can mute everyone. Thank that you. Would also You muted, Mike. Justin's um, muted. See, I was muted as well. Okay. So as a consequence of his inability to manage some of these family affairs in prison, he's now home in the halfway house and he's he's angry. They won't approve his job. They won't let him leave. They want him to work and they want him to go to a job that he doesn't approve of. His, his children aren't even coming to see him as a result of sort of the adjustment in prison. So sometimes we make decisions that get us further away from, from what we want. So I want to address that today, and then we'll get into the, the self-surrender checklist. There are many people on our team who have went to prison with, with children, and including someone on our team who's getting ready to go to prison with young children. So Kent, if it's okay with you, I'm going to please unmute yourself. If you would, you in prior webinars, you've addressed you're looking at 51 months, you only got 15 months. I don't want to go through that that narrative and testimonial, which we're grateful for. I just really want to focus on the fact that when are you going to prison, a little bit about the family dynamic and how you have managed that with a very young family. Sure, I'm happy to do it. So, yep, I'm, I'm surrendering on April 27th and I'm headed to Morgantown Prison Camp in West Virginia. And... Uh, it's been a long process. So I was the fact that I was indicted in 2019. Uh, it's been quite a quite a stretch. And if I had to do it over again, I think I would make some changes in the way I handled it with the kids. But I have four kids. So they go from 2015, uh, 14 and 11. And obviously, those ages have changed throughout the years, what have you. But at the very beginning, it was, um, I was married at the time, now I'm divorced. But the conversation that we had kind of off the bat was to kind of keep everybody to the side, silence, not really, really bringing up anything to them. And then as I progressed through the process and realized that I was going to be taking a plea and headed to prison, that's when the conversation started to change of how do I set expectations? What does this look like? Knowing that I was facing potentially 60 months, do I want to maybe scare the kids and make it sound like I'm going to be gone for five years, but I don't want to set bad expectations and say I'm going to be home uh, in six months or something crazy. So 
uh, it started with doing the math. So once uh, we kind of began to start to have the conversation of saying, do you guys remember when I was indicted? Do you remember when the police showed up? Do you remember this? There's been press releases. I mean, there's been some things going on and, and just kind of opened up about all of it. Um, and that included my youngest one. There was a bit of a question of, do I share it with, he was nine at the time, do we really get into it with a nine-year-old? And I would imagine it's different for everybody, but at least for me, he was, he's a smart kid. He's, he's coherent, he understood what was going on and was able to really start debunking a lot of the myths. So it became, they were all terrified about um, my safety. Am I gonna get hurt? The, the movies that you see with prison and the way things are, being able to set those expectations, say, you guys, this isn't what you think it is. It's not what the movies are gonna look like. I'm gonna be fine. Um, as far as time frames go, I, I just gave them a big window. I said, it, you know, I'm going to go, I'm gonna be gone for sure, but how long I'm gone, let me just do some math with you. And I started to break down, if I get sentenced to 36 months, here's what it's really gonna look like. If I get sentenced to fifth, I never said 15, because I didn't think I'd get that much, but kind of doing these ranges to say, here's what it actually means and starting to say, you know, you guys will be able to visit. We'll be able to talk. There's going to be emails. I can do phone calls. It's making them understand that um, just because the number at the beginning before sentencing was a specific number that didn't translate to the reality of how long I was physically going to be gone. That was probably one of the biggest things. Um, secondarily is after I got sentenced, <clears throat> started to have this this when I got sentenced in November my surrender date's been delayed a few times but and as soon as I got sentenced I was able to do the math set the expectations with them and tell them how long I'm physically going to be gone and what this is going to look like and then the emails communication all that stuff was great but in preparing the kids it started up with and this wasn't my idea it was my therapist who I'd been seeing now for a while he'd been in this space worked with people that had gone to prison and was very open and saying um, you just need to find a way to get your kids to open up. What are they going to miss? What are the things you could be doing before you go? Is there anything in particular? And just kind of have one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions with each of the kids and, um, and really just debunk any of the, the worries or, or problems that they have. And if there's things you could teach them, do ahead of time, um, start to do some of those things. So for instance, for me, it sounds kind of silly, but um, they were worried about making breakfast in the morning and cutting their hair and random little things like that. So I started to do a lot of just teaching one-on-one -on -one of the kids to prepare them for, and I'm not going to be around. <clears throat> um, and just always checking in with them because this has been a long process for me. So sometimes we go through stretches where uh, you kind of just live in life, but it, now that my clock's really ticking where I've got 21 days before I'm gone, it's a reminder to go, is there anything else I could be doing? What else you worried about? Things like that. So we're going to jump. I want others to engage. I'd like, I'm going to call on Matt, Ron. I'd love for you to co contribute as well in a moment. There are a number of people <clears throat> who say, I, I don't want my family to come and see me in prison. It's just uh, too difficult. I don't want my kids to see me. Now, most of the time when I hear that, that philosophy or approach changes because they absolutely want to see their family. As we talk about preparing to surrender to prison, Kent, and we'll transition into six to 10 today, but last week we talked about a primary point of contact. Have you organized, if it's your ex-wife or your parents, a visitation schedule, when the kids are going to come and see you? I presume you do want them to, to come and see you. Have you gone through those, those preparations and are you have you given thought to visiting with your kids in prison? Yeah, they're, they're absolutely going to be coming. And my relationship with my ex-wife isn't necessarily the best. So finding a way to do this, we, at the same time, I'm going through the criminal stuff. I had some domestic relations stuff with the divorce we were still kind of handling. So I actually got that stuff written into an order. So I'm going to have the, my kids are going to be able to come visit me. Um, it was actually written in that it'd be once every four weeks, they'd at least have the ability to come see me. And I've had my parents be able to write in that they're going to be able to drive them. So their grandparents are going to pick them up and be able to take them to and from the camp to come visit with me. Um, told them about uh, the way the phone calls work with 15 minute caps and emails and just kind of giving them an understanding of how we're going to be able to communicate in between the visits that they do with me. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say I, I have set it up. They, they're planning on coming to see me and I've I've done as much as you, I think you probably can in trying to set the expectation and lower anxiety, but 
you know, I'm, I'm assuming on the day that they come to see me, especially for the first time, there's going to be some nervousness before they walk in as to what's happening and how this all goes, but so they plan to come. So some quick thoughts. Every family is unique and, and, and different. I've had clients regret over the years telling their children all at once <clears throat> when they have several kids because they felt maybe one of the siblings responded differently because the other siblings were there. They've said, I should have done it individually. Even though I'm divorced, I should have done it with my spouse. Others have then said, I wish my ex-wife or spouse wasn't even there. <laughs> Excuse me, I've been sick all week. I'm getting better. So you just have to use your, your judgment. Mistake that some people make is not disclosing or telling them at all. And under the idea, you're not going to go to prison. The lawyers told you you're going to get probation. You think it's too early. And there have been, in the age of Google and the Department of Justice press releases, and this happened many, many years ago in Connecticut, a, a daughter walked into class only to see kids in the classroom spreading around her father's DOJ press releases. And there are it was heartbreaking, right? She didn't know. Parents hadn't told her. And now she feels ostracized in her own classroom. People are vicious and people take pleasure in the pain of other people. And clearly this, one of her students' parents gave her this release and thought it would be fun, as sickening and tragic as that is. And then it was even more trauma for the, this daughter seeing this get circled around about her father. Experience tells me the teenage years are the toughest, the 13, 14, 15, all these kids now have iPhones and they're very influenced. At, at at home. Many people have said, we had someone go to prison with like an infant. And they're like, this is better time than if he was 10 or 11 or 12 years old. He'll never, he'll never remember it. So if you don't want to tell them, you got to own that. If you think you're going to get probation or you want to wait until you get clarity, you've got to own the consequences that can follow as it spreads in the community. I like that Kent managed expectations well because of prison reform, RDAP, we have someone who's 65 years old who's going to be going in for um, like four years with the drug program, with the elderly offender program. And his ex-wife, unfortunately, started telling everyone on Facebook, he's gone for four years. He's gone for four years. He's gone for four years. And of course, the math isn't four years. It could turn out to be like a year. I mean, it's going to be a very brief period of time, but the kids have this four years fixated in their mind. So what all of you need to do is manage expectations and understand the First Step Act, understand prison reform, understand the mechanisms that exist to get you out, uh, to get you out as early as possible. Kent, I know you have four children. Ron, I appreciate you for engaging. I know you're um, you're a father. You have an All-American football player. He's going to be playing football in college while, while you might be in prison. I'd love to, to learn from you. All of us can learn of how you broach the conversation sure. with uh, with uh, with your children, as I know, it wasn't easy. No, it wasn't, and and obviously, there's we all share. There's a lot of shame and that comes along with with having to confront our our children and and explain to them what happened. I made the decision. I believe it was the right one. I was very transparent uh, with my kids, uh, literally from day one. I told them what the process was, all of my court appearances, my my pre-sentence interview, we discussed uh, all the way up to sentencing, we discussed. Matter of fact, I had to fight them to keep them from going to sentencing. That was a personal decision I made only because it was in Denver and I'm located outside of Atlanta. Um, the other thing that I've done, and, and I think it's important for my kids now, I, I'm a little anal, but it just happens I was working on it today. I didn't know you were going to talk about this, but I created a book similar to this for, for each of my kids. It's a binder, uh, including my ex-wife. And inside there is a lot of the notes that we talk about that tells them what to expect. I did the math so they could see it with earn time credits, what my sentence will be. I put in there clips where, where from um, Bureau of Prisons of how to contact me, how to email me, how to visit me, what the visitation rules are, what's my prison number, how to mail me, uh, literally step by step, everything that they need to know. And that that puts that puts the power in in their hands. Uh, I've told them, you know, I'm not really excited. I'm of the opinion I'm not really excited for them to visit me just because I I don't like that image because I'm a proud father. But at the same time, I know I'm going to miss them. So I've told them that's their choice. If they want to visit me, I would love to see them. And this book gives them all the, all answers all their questions of how they can reach out to me and come see me. My kids are 16, 18, and 26. So um, for me, it's, it, so far, they've been very supportive. Um, I'm, I'm glad I made the decision I made. And, uh, and they appreciate, like with this binder I made for them, they appreciate the effort that I made 
to answer all their questions and make it very transparent. Ron, something that's come up with parents who are going to prison where their children view them as a role model and they're, they're idle and they've been such leaders and, and supported them and pillars of the, the community, they feel there's this, this image their children have of them. And then they're afraid as a result of this case and imprisonment, it could shatter that image and this perception that's existed right. for so long. And there could be another of responses to that. You can argue that the responding honorably with integrity, showing these are the consequences of bad choices. And there's a you can learn from that. Uh, others don't feel that way. Others will say, I think I got a raw deal. I shouldn't be going to prison. And some children don't know what to believe. I know the way your children ad admire you. Did you feel as if that image they had of you was somewhat shattered? I, I did. And, and I was torn for a while. It took me a, a little bit to get my hands around how I wanted to, to handle it. And, and to me, so much I, that I do in life, my personal life, I draw from my experience in business. And what became apparent to me was the messaging. The messaging that I was putting out was important. And the, the messaging that I put out, and not just to my kids, but to people around me, what I tried to explain is I'm not going to let a, a series of bad decisions uh, over a short period of time define me, define a lifetime of success. And, and that's the messaging I say to my children. Look at the success I've had, successes I've had in a, in a lifetime of 30 years. Don't let this two or three years that I made bad decisions define that whole 30 year period. And, and that's the messaging I try to tell them, but I own my mistakes. And I think it's important, especially people that haven't gone to, to their sentencing hearings yet. I think it's important to, to immediately own up to your mistakes. Don't blame it on other people. Same way with your children. I made bad decisions. I should have known better. Uh, I want to talk to you about it because I want to show you how easy it is to make bad decisions. And uh, but the bottom line is the messaging. I, I just try to tell them I'm not going to let this process define a lifetime of achievements. And 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 Mr. Carper, I'd love to call on you you for in a moment. And before I do, so please unmute yourself. There's also value in letting them see how you overcome really bad choices. And we'll discuss that with Matt in a few minutes. So there are some people. And I've attended these sentencing hearings where children, remember, I joke, I j joke, I shouldn't joke. When I came home from prison and I was trying to get into this industry, I use my passes in the halfway house to go to sentencing hearings. Believe it or not, I've been to more than a thousand, but it's not hard. You just sit there for eight hours a day, five days a week over many sentencing hearings, you're going to get a thousand. And it was very heartbreaking when some children would be at a sentencing hearing and they would not just get filleted and embarrassed by the judge over the case. That's one thing. It's another thing when the judge says, what the hell do you do all day? You sit around all day. You won't work. You think certain jobs are too good for you. You don't contribute to your community. You've made no payment towards restitution. Not only did you break the law, you've done nothing to show why you're worthy of leniency. And you got the kids. It's like the double whammy. So at least with Ron, even though he made bad choices as a result of his leading and advocating and mitigating and not sitting at home all day complaining, he got six years instead of 14, which means he'll be home in two or three years instead of 10. So there's a way to respond to the case. You can sit at home and do nothing and complain, or you can work to create this new record as Ron did, as Matt did. And we're going to get to Matt in a moment. Mr. Carper, there are people on this webinar who have children, who have Loved one, you know, children in prison. How did you respond as a father when you heard from Scott that he was going to be going to, to prison? What was that conversation like for you? And how are you working as a parent to hold him accountable while while he's in custody? I know my parents were shocked when I told them my mom went to therapy and blamed herself. How, how did you respond when your son said, I'm going to be going to prison? It's, it's kind of hard, kind of hard to answer that because it was a process rather than happening all at once. I mean, I, I found out he was in trouble because I got a phone call uh, from uh, the uh, Homeland Security and uh, talked to him just about as I was leaving to, to go on a international trip. Uh, and then he disappeared for uh, a period of time in which I had a very, very hard time finding him and finding out what had happened and what was going on. Uh, I'm a lawyer and a uh, educator by training, so my initial reaction is to go to work, to do what I do, set aside emotion, just deal with the problem. So that's 
kind of how I dealt with it. I, I, uh, he got accused of some things that I did not believe and do not believe he did. So uh, th that hasn't changed. So that's well, uh, also. Uh, I, I, I appreciate you sharing. Telling parents you're going to prison is, is, is a surreal experience and also telling children. To that end, Matt O'Callaghan's on, on our team. He's in home confinement. Matt, can you tell us a little bit about your children, how you discussed it with them and and how you nurtured relationships while you served your sentence at Lewisburg. Yeah, absolutely. Good uh, morning, good afternoon. Um, uh, thanks for letting me speak on this topic. It's actually, it's one of the paramount reasons why, you know, I look forward to working with you guys, working with the people in this community. Um, when you get in trouble uh, for bad decisions you've made, you're not just affecting yourself. There's a ripple effect of people you are affecting. And, you know, for those of us that do have, you know, a spouse or children, um, it can be pretty drastic. In my case, uh, you know, I was arrested at home. It was in the news that day. It was everyone knew right away. So there was not a, there was no question as to when we would speak to the children initially about uh, what was going on. Uh, at that time, my kids were 15 and 12, a uh, daughter and a son. Um, Initially, you know, after that happened, my wife and I sat them down, you know, in early days, explaining to them that, you know, dad made some bad decisions at work. Uh, now it's time to, you know, pay the piper, take the consequences. I explained that, you know, I was never going to lie to them. I was going to be fully transparent through this process. They are not the type of children that wanted to ask detailed questions. As the process went along, uh, you know, getting closer to sentencing, the plea deal and sentencing, having a better understanding of what the timeline was going to be. Um, we opened up the conversation a little bit further to them. At the same time, you know, we went into this trying to not manage the situation, but we set some timelines in our lives, you know, milestones that we wanted to be, they wanted me to be home for. Um, one was my daughter's high school graduation. And then the second one is my son's lacrosse season, which actually starts today. And he's got his first game in about an hour that I'll be going to. So like, it's actually a pretty momentous day for me. Um, I set target to be home and to be able to go to this game, uh, for my son's high school career and it's happening. And it, you know, with the help of you guys, Justin, I do, I once again, thank you. And, you know, having a strong game plan. Now, I just wanted to tell that anecdote because it's, you know, rare you get to say something positive or happy here. So that's a nice thing. But as far as while I was away at Lewisburg, which is a camp uh, that is a, about three, three hours from our home. Um, firstly, you know, the way we did it was I made sure that both children were up and schooled on the email app. Uh, I found... I found personally that for my son, it was easier to communicate through him with email. He was the younger one. Uh, he's a typical boy, so on the phone, I'd say, how's your day? I'd get a fine. How was practice? Fine. You know, <laughs> things all parents deal with. Um, on the email, he was a little bit more verbose. He, he was able to take his time to think about what he wanted to say, and that worked out well for me. My daughter uh, was a little bit more of a chatterbox, so the phone worked out well for her, which was great. Um, she was a true rock star. She, she actually, she came to visit me three times by herself. Um, being, you know, a high school junior, she drove out by herself, wanted to sit with dad, have a soda, eat some candy and hear about all the crazy stuff that was happening in prison. Um, so one thing that, you know, everyone, every situation is different. Uh, I found that one thing that happened, you know, sort of to echo what Ron was saying, I took responsibility right away for what, you know, the decisions I made. I said that, you know, not everything is true that is being displayed in the, in the media, but at the heart of it, I, I did do um, something that was wrong and I'm going to make it right. So I made it very clear that I'm going to get this process going as soon as I can, which I did with, you know, I, as much expediency. Um, and, you know, just the one note I have 
as far as while the children, you know, while you're away from your children, while you're away from your spouse, levity can go far, a pretty far way, you know, sharing a funny anecdote that happened that day. Um, not every conversation has to be morbid and dour. You know, it's a matter of finding something they would appreciate. You know, I saw, you know, a duck fall into a pond. That was funny. You know, I think <laughs> something of that nature. Um, how did how, how, right in their day? How, how did you respond when? And, and Kent, I want to transition to a comment that Kent made. If you're in prison, there's things you can't do because you're confined. And if you speak with your spouse, and it's like, I'm overworked. I'm just overwhelmed. We got the kid stuff. And you're, how, there are some men when I was in prison who would say like what do you want me to do? I'm an effing prison. There's nothing I can do. And it would make matters worse. Ken's going in soon. A number of people are going in with children. How would you respond when you would just hear that inevitable frustration? Like you're in prison, you're not here to help me. Listen, those days are going to be common. You know, life, life is challenging under the best of circumstances and the daily grind for your partner um, only gets compounded when they have double duty. You know, they have to do all the school runs. They have to do all the shopping at the supermarket, all the, you know, all the nitty gritty things. So what I did was, you know, I would just say, sorry, to, sorry to hear that. I'm sorry you're having a hard day. Um, you know, I, I would try to keep my word short and just be a listener and, you know, go with empathy. That, that's the best advice, because when I would hear men respond that way in prison, I know they were they were more angry at themselves that they were there, but we, we tend to project and take it out on people we're closest to. I want to transition to something that, that Kent wrote, educating the children on how to respond to others is important too. help them on how to respond to friends, teachers, and other parents, both after indictment and after sentencing. Matt, did you have that conversation with your kids about how to address the fact that daddy's in prison? I did. Um, it's actually... It's sort of interesting. It came from the genesis of it was the first conversation my wife and I had, and I had with our kids when the day I got arrested. The day I got arrested, I remember I came home that night. We were eating spaghetti in just total shock, the four of us. And the message that we wanted to share with the kids is like, yes, this is happening. Yes, this is public. But every family, every person you know, every family you know goes through things. Some of them are public. Some of them are private. But everyone has their challenges and no life is perfect. So, you know, just understand that, you know, you're going through a hard time right now. Everyone goes through a hard time. It won't be the last hard thing you go through, but you'll make it through. So I appreciate that. I want to leave. I want to comment on someone said, so tell my daughter that's five years old that I'm going to jail. So what our team, every children, adolescent has different capacities and strengths and develop at later stages. The answer could depend on what what's the potential length of your prison term. We had someone who unfortunately got just a, a six or seven months in federal prison, but the biggest issue was the deportation that the father was looking to, was going to get deported back to Canada as a result of, of the crime when his wife and children were American. And even though he'd been here for 30 years, he failed to establish residency. That was harder. You're going to Canada. So we encourage you to use your own skill set and it really depends in part on the length of the sentence. Uh, Scott can attest to this, Matt, you can. There are a lot of guys with young children, they're, they'll tell their dad, they'll say, daddy's going to work for the government for a little while. <laughs> okay, Scott, did you hear some of that when, when you were in the camp? And I had one guy who refused to tell his children and he had the, for those of you who've been to federal prison know this, at certain intervals, the phones say, this call is from a federal prison. He he had a time where he could talk to each kid and then pass the phone to his wife and miss it. And I felt like he was really just missing out on an opportunity to be real with his family and, and make the journey more manageable. So you're you're going to see that. And when if someone is, I had a friend in prison that did that. His name was Adam and his son, uh, Evan, used to visit him. And he, Evan thought his dad was working for the federal government and that he was so young, he didn't think it was odd that during visitation, you still have to stand for count. You just stand for count and visitation or that there's a certain bathroom. He just said, this is daddy's working for, for the government. Now, I don't know if years later, the son is going to regret the father didn't tell him the truth. We're in kind of crisis mode and you have to use your skill set to think what's going to get us through this day into the next day. And 
and stay together. So to the question of, should you tell your five-year-old daughter? I can't answer that question for you, but we're having this conversation with, for you and with you to encourage you to use your own skill set, to use your own judgment. Part of the answer I can say will depend on the length of your prison term and how long you might actually be away from, um, from home. Someone did comment, and I've seen this as well at a number of sentencing hearings, having children um, speak at a sentencing hearing um, as well can be very impactful for, for the judge. Presuming it's the right message, it can't be my dad shouldn't go to prison. I've seen this, dad shouldn't go to prison, it's a waste of taxpayer resources. Do you know all the crimes these politicians and other people commit who are not prosecuted? It might feel good and it might be honest to you, but it's the wrong message. So if it's the right message and your children want to speak at a sentencing hearing, they can. Not all judges want to hear children speak. They may limit it to one. Some judges will say, hey, your kid already wrote a letter. I'm also not going to let them speak. That happened recently at a sentencing hearing in Los Angeles. The judge said, you're not going to have it both ways. They wrote a letter, no talking. But I do love the idea of being transparent, but also putting yourself in their shoes. What would they want? What would what would you want to do if here, if God forbid it was your loved one? But there are consequences to delaying with the with the DOJ, especially with these these press releases and um, and just the way that the way that they can get out. I want to see if there's any other questions here. Someone actually just commented, "My daughter is 29, wants to do an allocution for me during sentencing. Is is it a good or bad idea?" I just answered that question. If it's the right messaging, if it shows leadership that you owned it, you don't blame. You're setting an example that people can make bad decisions and overcome them with not just talk but through actions. Then it's the right message. If it's the wrong message, I would encourage her both to not write a letter uh, or speak. I will say the good news is everyone who says they're not going to visit with their kids in prison, they always end up visiting, including the guys that will say, I won't even take a photo with my kids in prison. They do. Matt, did you take photos with your kids in prison and hang, hang them in the locker? So many guys say they won't, and they do. Did you? We weren't allowed to do that, um, but we have a number, of, uh, a number of funny videos. We made a thing every time my daughter left. She would get out of the car and do a dab. So we have a bunch of videos of two of us dabbing across the prison yard, which is pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that that's fantastic. Of course, there are strategies to stay connected with, with your kids. I did this with my mom. I didn't have children. I was 33. Um, my mom and I would simultaneously read the same book. And we would discuss it during visitation. And after about three months, she said, I can no longer read any of these ethics and philosophy books you like. I'm going in a different direction. They put me to sleep. But for a while, it, it was fun. And of course, you could now build those book reports into your release plan, even mention that you're doing this with, with your family. But anything you can do to stay connected, we think is a, is a good idea. I would love to engage and ask if anyone else is willing to contribute. Andy, forgive me, I've forgotten if you have children or not. I know you were recently sentenced. If there's anyone that could chime in and offer their insights of what they did well, what they would do differently um, as a result of going through this process, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. Is there anyone before we uh, transition to this part of, of the webinar? Anyone? Hey, Justin. Yes, Andy here. Sorry, I'm I'm in a car wash. I apologize. If it's, no, that, that's okay. Uh, thanks. Done. Thanks. Okay. We'd, we'd, we'd love um, to hear from you for, for, by the way, everyone, Andy got a great outcome last week at sentencing two years. He's going to go to Leavenworth. In fact, Andy, Mr. Carper, if it's okay, I'd love to connect you with Andy. He's going to be going to Leavenworth where, where your son is and we'll, we'll make this uh, connection. My, my son will be of great help to Andy. Thank, thank you. I will, I will make that connection. Thank send, you. Send me as much information as you can so I can forward it on to him. He will be delighted. He, he's already kind of a resource at the at the camp for a lot of people. So anyway. Well, I, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I've, I've got um, a 22-year-old college student and a 25-year-old graduate student. And um uh, you know, I, my journey, you know, as far as dealing with it with them started four years ago when I um, sought help for addiction. And, you know, so at that time, I didn't realize that I was going to be facing federal charges, um, you know, and talking about addiction is, is hard enough, but that that's where I started. I was just very honest with them. They knew that I had a history of back pain and back surgeries. And, and I, I'm just, I'm really glad that I, that I was upfront with them because they, 
even though at the time, you know, they, they were younger uh, than they are now, <laughs> four years younger, uh, uh, they still uh, took it really well. I mean, they're, they are young adults. And, um, and the, I guess my big message is what Justin said earlier, uh, I couldn't agree with more. I think my kids are learning a lot from seeing me face difficulty, face mistakes, and deal with it in a way that I'm proud of. And, and I think that's the example you, you're you setting, Ron has said, Kent has sent, and I love this comment by Dee, who said, it is difficult to manage what family members are saying to your kids. I had that. Uh, I had a kind of an, an estranged member of my family who took some pleasure. I don't play. She's gossipy. And she would share my press release with people. Did you see this? OMG. And it was very devastating, not so much to me, but to, to my mom who wanted to put a stop to it. And I said, we can't, you, you can't stop it. You can't stop it. This is a consequence of my bad decisions. It's my fault. And she'd say, it's not your fault that she's spreading it. I'd say, it's my fault I broke the law. It's my fault I lied to the government. It's my fault I didn't mitigate. It's my fault I hired these lawyers. It's my fault and I'm gonna to work to fix it. And as soon as I just always said, it's my fault, I'll do better, that seemed to calm everyone in my family down. But there is, to be clear, uh, you're not gonna be able to control what your friends, people you think are your friends. There were some, I went to prison 15 years ago this month and there were some messages floating around about, I hope Justin doesn't drop the soap in the kitchen and the shower, laugh out loud. There are people that take pleasure in your pain, especially if they think you've had success and it just makes them feel good. So to the extent that you can help your children understand that, perhaps it turns out to be a good learning lesson or life lesson, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the pain that accompanies being away, which is why you've got to do everything you can to mitigate and understand that once you're in prison, do all you can to get out of there as, as quickly as possible, uh, avoiding problems, not doing anything to extend your stay. Another week, another call, another husband caught with an iPhone in prison, another husband lose the year of the drug program, another husband's going to lose the good time with children, and now the result is, what, an extra two years in federal prison? It's gone from bad to truly uh, horrific. So I appreciate everyone's contributions on this subject. If there's questions we haven't answered, we will. And with that said, I want to, with about 20 minutes left in this webinar, Ron, when are you surrendering? What, when is the, the when are you heading to Montgomery? What, what is, what are some surrendered? I know Frank's going in and got a couple of months, Kent this month. Ron, when are you heading in? May 1st. So Ron's so heading in. Uh, about three and a half weeks. Three and a half weeks. Okay. So I know some of you have, we've gone through this before, including Ron, but as we prepare for, for federal prison, I wanna go through these items in, in, our, in our checklist, if, if you can see my, my screen. It's a good idea to go to bop.gov to take a look at the, at the commissary list and get an, an idea of what it is you, you hope to spend. The budget's $360 a month. Some prisons will allow you to spend, I think it's 180 every other week. Some prisons may let you do the whole 360 at once. If you can, I'd encourage you to be kind of sporadic and not go in there and spend all of it at once and help six guys. Hey, can you carry my belongings upstairs? It could be a little off-putting. Spread it out. Don't be patient. Excuse me, be patient. You're going to have you know plenty of things there. But I'd encourage you to spend some time looking at the commissary list, prioritizing what you'd like to buy. It is a good idea to read the inmate handbook, even though many of them have, haven't been updated in a decade. In fact, things that are in the inmate handbook, they say would be a disciplinary infraction, would no longer be a disciplinary infraction, but it's just a good idea, we think, to spend some time reading uh, the handbook. Hey, Scott, this we put this in here just for you. Scott's former home at Yankton Federal Prison Camp in South Dakota. Scott, curiously, did you read this inmate handbook before you surrendered? I didn't read all of it, and it burned me at one point in time because Why? here's what happens. Once they give you that handbook and they tell you to read it, there's no, oh, I didn't know that was a rule. I didn't know that was a policy. There's no talking your way out of things. So as, as mundane as it can be, as monotonous, it is really important to understand every nuanced detail of that book because anything goes and it's their policies and, and you don't have any excuses when you don't follow every rule to the T. So it's a good idea before you go to prison to read the, the inmate handbook, something we've heard over the years, that the mattresses in prison, 
for example, could be a little thin. I could have gotten into to trouble for this. There are some prisoners who will hustle their way into getting people better mattresses a little thicker. In order to get a better mattress, it has to be approved by staff, but sometimes they'll just switch it out. But if caught, that's a disciplinary infraction. That could have happened uh, to me. It's happened to, to other people. So you just need to, to read it as monotonous as it may feel. You'll get an idea of what, <laughs> excuse me, the institution uh, is going to give you what you can expect. That can even help you manage your, your commissary shopping, the personal clothes and whatnot. Of course, it goes into great detail about what you can and cannot do. No smoking. You can't go into another, another dorm without permission. I saw people written up for going into another dorm without permission. Some guards don't like it. Some guards may have it out for you. You need to be aware of that, even if you've done it a hundred times. <laughs> Excuse me. It doesn't, doesn't mean that it's right. I saw guys getting written up if their cubicle wasn't clean enough or if they weren't out at their work detail on time. So just spend time going through um, going through this this inmate this inmate handbook. Uh, what will help you, Ron? Have you had a chance to go through the inmate handbook at, at Montgomery yet, or is that on your is that on your to do? You probably printed it out and made notes. There we go. Ron's a planner, everyone. <laughs> okay. So so there there you go. These are things that. That, that you should consider. Also, what you can uh, surrender with glasses, a wedding ring. Uh, we Some prisoners, some people try to get in with money. Sometimes they'll take it. If not, we have all of these resources for you at Prison Professors so you know how to send money. Uh, so we can put them here in the chat. When I send out the webinar replay, I'll include them. We have all of these resources for you on uh, how to send money, what the email communication is going to look like. In, in federal prison. But we would encourage you as you prepare for your surrender to have formed that budget as we discussed last week. And upon your surrender, have someone go to either Western Union. I think it takes four to six hours for the money to hit your account, but have all of these things planned out so you have money on your books for that first, for that first commissary shopping. Anything I didn't add here, anything that anyone would, uh, would, would like to add? I have a quick question. Yes. Glasses. Yes. Do they so, have any metal on them? Do you need to go get a new pair before you go, like just a plain plastic generic, or can it just be, can there be metal? Does anybody know the answer to that? I believe we do have the answer, Scott. Anyone can offer any insights and then I'll offer mine. I didn't find any issues with bringing my glasses into camp, and I was able to receive a, a beautiful pair of the BOP issued glasses, which I still have and cherish very much within a reasonable amount of time. I think it took one to two months. So as we wrote here, choose inexpensive, sturdy glasses. The BOP commissary will likely sell reading glasses. If a person requires a stronger lens, bring your prescription glasses. Again, choose sturdy rather than decorative uh, frame. So it helps if you say, well, these are, don't, I wouldn't say these are for reading because then they're not, they may not let you bring it in. They're going to want you to buy it in the, in the commissary. So you really want to state these are required. I need them. Um, I I have been told plastic would be better than metal, but really it's kind of like a, a wedding ring. You can ring in a wedding ring that presuming it doesn't look more than a hundred dollars. I'd kind of follow that same advice for your glasses, nothing flashy or ostentatious. And I've been told plastic sturdier is better than uh, something that looks expensive and even metal, but really try to make the point that it's required. And if you have a prescription, I'd bring a prescription. Make sense? Any other questions on this topic? Okay. Now, understanding medical preparations is is a is a big deal. And Frank, I don't know if you'd be willing to engage us in, in a moment or two. Perhaps I can transition it over to you in a moment to get some of your insights. But there are a number of people who don't fully invest the time to understand the medical preparations and what life can be like on the inside. Now, a number of people who work with our team will spend a lot of time with Carol, as Frank has. Carol is Michael's wife. They married when Michael had 11 years left in prison. She is a registered nurse, and there's probably no one better that understands the BOP and policy, including medical preparations, than, than Carol Santos. She is an encyclopedia of knowledge because she endured it for so long, plus she's a nurse. So if you, as you're preparing to go to federal prison, some basic things that, that you can do. Make sure all medications are, are in your probation report. We got a call last week from someone who did their PSR two years ago. And they've had some medical issues in part due to COVID. And we suggested amend the PSR, like get it on the record. The judge will do it. 
the lawyer didn't suggest it, we do. Thankfully, the judge, uh, they're going to do it. Get everything in the probation report, the medications, letters from physicians. If you have substance abuse or alcohol problems, get treatment, get all of that on the, the record. Someone, for example, recently requested a surrender. The, the judge said, I need to see some evidence from a, a medical professional that you need more time. They got the letter. The judge gave the ex delayed the surrender. So understand what the medical preparations look like, get it in the PSR, and there could be some value in going to the Bureau of Prisons formulary list. Now, unfortunately, this is this one was done in 2019. It's not always great. There are people that try to handicap what they're going to get in federal prison. It's not always so, but you can expect them to transition you to generic medications because they generally care about keeping costs of costs down. So you might not always get the same medications that, that you're receiving right now. We would encourage you to surrender with medications, typically two weeks worth of, of medications or a week, they are gonna transition you. So in a moment, I'd love to speak with someone who had to deal with medical issues in prison. Frank, to you, I know there's been some health issues and you worked with Carol. Frank actually worked with a former BOP official on our team who ran medical for the BOP. Frank, can you just talk about that process and the value of learning more about what your health care will be like when you go to Butner? Um, yes, and th thanks so much, Justin. Um, I think I mentioned uh, in one of our sessions that the bad news was that, to our surprise, I got assigned to Butner uh, Camp, which is 3,000 miles away from my home, uh, and suddenly, you know, stomach dropped, and then we you know, again, with kind of your mantra um, said, well, what's the, the good of this, you know, versus what is the bad of it? And as it turned out, I do have a good deal of medical issues. And it turns out that Butner was one of the best places to go in the entire BOP system. Uh, and then working along with Carol, working along with the um, WCA and, um, you know, EF team, and Carol specifically coordinating, um, we were able to put together a plan. Uh, turns out that Butner has many of the programs that I'm going to need uh, for serving you know, my time a year and a day, hopefully much less than that if I do all good things. And um, that without her uh, and others, I would not have been able to put together our lists. Um, we still continue to talk and communicate, putting together the formulary lists. Um, I think I just posted something in the question column of what about an orthopedic mattress wedge uh, that my orthopedic surgeon is writing a uh, letter for. And then um, couldn't stress more, uh, as you have in your list, prepare, prepare, prepare. And that includes even having everything in the right form, having your letters say the right things, um, and then, um, uh, you know, just making sure every I is dotted, T is crossed as far as prescriptions go, how things read, look at the formulary, make sure that everything matches up to your prescriptions. Uh, and then surrendering our, ourselves um, uh, very, very well prepared and making sure that we follow those instructions to the T as well. Um, and, and again, law of unintended consequences turned out that a place 3,000 miles away was absolutely the best place for us to go. And Justin, we could not thank you and your team enough for the preparation that we have received and continue to receive. Um, and that also includes with the help of Carol and um, you know, the BOP person uh, or former BOP person, uh, we were just able to get an additional 60 day extension uh, through the court on surrender so that I could continue tapering off of some prescription drugs. Uh, that I was on that the facility did not have uh, the ability to allow me to taper off of. Um, so based on that, and based on all the help, we were able to get the additional 60 days. So again, could not have done it without you. And um, you're in our prayers every day. I, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Thank you for doing the work. So as you're preparing to go to prison, and if you have any medical issues, all our team encourages you to spend some time on the BOP formulary list to assess what you're going to receive. If you have specific questions and weaning off medication and you're concerned about not getting a medication that's vital to you, what some people will do is speak with Carol and other BOP officials that, that we retain to ensure that you get the right information. 
I see comments about, you know, bringing a mattress and things of that nature. Someone said not at this prison. We have seen prison people surrender to prison with letters from their uh, podiatrist stating they need a special pair of shoes. It's listed in the PSR and they're able to get in with a pair of shoes because of the letter, because it's disclosed in the PSR. And two things happen. One, they get the shoes they need. And two, they don't have to drop 80 bucks in the commissary, which counts against their 360, right? So this is all the value of, uh, of planning and taking appropriate action. And yes, there's a chance you do this work and they still say you ain't bringing them in. That's just the way it goes. We encourage you to prepare and try. Let's get back to this top 10 list. Uh, step eight, develop a personal communication and success plan. You already saw Ron do that as evidenced by everything he wrote out for his boys and his plan in prison. He'll have a website. He's going to document it uh, and share it with, uh, with, with the world. We also encourage you, as you know, to share it with your case manager, with your judge, with your prosecutor, with your probation officer, all of these people who will continue to have an influence on your life. We encourage you to share all of this work with them, understand the various ways to communicate. Email is five cents a minute in the federal prison system. Scott, is phone, can someone confirm, is it still free phone calls because of COVID or are they charging again? When I left, phone calls were still free. We were at, I think it was 500 a month, but there were rumblings that they're dropping it back down to 300 and there's charge, they're, they're charging. I don't know if anyone's been released sooner than I have or speaking with family members who are in there. Does anyone else have any insight? Can anyone comment? If people, uh, Mr. Mr. Carper, for example, do you know if Scott's phone calls are still free and has over 500 minutes a month? Can anyone comment on that? I believe they're still free. I think that's probably going to go off when the CARES Act uh, stops in the middle of next month. Something we're, we're also going to discuss, I want to discuss this next week. We're going to be bringing John Gustin back on, who's the head of home confinement and halfway house for the BOP for more than 20 years now that the CARES Act is ending. I want to talk more about halfway house home confinement, preparing for it, jobs, including um, will the 25% requirement in the halfway house come back? So as many of you know, when like when I was in the halfway house, I had to pay 25% of my gross pay every week to the halfway house. That went away with COVID. I suspect with COVID ending, that will come back. And that will really have an influence on work and employment and what they approve and furloughs and what type of job you're doing and how much money you're making and getting that job approved. They're going to want that money. And I want to get confirmation and discuss that with John next week, which again comes back to if even if you've been yet to get sentenced or go to prison, you want to be thinking about employment in the halfway house or if you don't have to work what volunteer organizations exist. If not, as you'll hear us express next week, they're gonna say, go work here because this is a company we have an agreement with because we want our 25% or we just want you to be working. And that's when a number of people then say, damn, I wish I had a job lined up and two, I think I'd like to go back to federal prison and that's no longer an option. We're gonna discuss a lot of that next week with, with John, but to close number eight on our list, Spend time on how you're going to communicate. There are some people that don't want to be responding to emails all day, like they're having a conversation or a text message. They don't want it. They will tell their people, oh, you're going to hear from me once a week or once a day. CoreLinks gives you the opportunity to respond to everyone on your list at once, which is great. So you don't have to get embroiled in individual conversations throughout the day. There are some people that like breaking away from the iPhone and the email and the texting and the nonstop communication. Some people, of course, can't do without it. But we'd encourage you now as you prepare for your surrender to prison to manage expectations on how quickly or how frequently you're going to call. For example, we have people that go in that tell their friends, I love you, I'm going to miss you, but every one of my minutes and email time is going for my wife and kids. It's that simple. Hopefully if visitation opens up, you can come and see me. It's managed so people aren't later disappointed. Uh, number nine, Create your quadrant guide for decision-making. We've covered it before, but we'll cover it again. Since we've covered it, can someone give me an assessment of, of what this means when, when Michael wrote this quadrant guide for, for decision-making? First quadrant, make decisions that offer a high prospect for success with low levels of risk. What, what does that mean? Can someone give me a specific idea of a high prospect for success with low levels of risk? Anyone? For me, it was reading books and writing book reports. Right. right. High prospect for success is I'm using my time wisely. I'm documenting my journey. I'm, I'm proving to various stakeholders uh, how this time will benefit me. Low levels of risk. Last time I checked, no one's getting in trouble at prison for, for reading books. 
Right. So a low prospect for success, high levels of risk, of course, would be gambling, which a number of people do, playing cards all day, watching TV all day. Not a lot of success can be high levels of risk. Some people would disagree with that. They would say it's low success, low risk. Depends on the TV room. It just depends how you respond in there. But I got into a habit with Michael's urging, and he would ask me at the end of the day, what quadrant did you fall into today? And the answer is I was a different quadrant throughout the period of the day. Sometimes I did low prospects for success with high levels of risk. That would include if I ever engaged in the prison hustle, which I occasionally did. There were parts of my day that were low and low and high and high. But when I broke my day into those quadrants, I would then think, you know, I kind of need to get it together here and do things that are going to lead to more success. The high prospect for success with low levels of risk, though, as Ron will learn by writing his blog in prison or others, it is certainly higher risk and higher reward to maintain a website in prison. It's higher risk and higher reward to document the journey because it could be off, I don't want to say off-putting to staff, but they're going to review it. But also some prisoners can get jealous and upset if they think that you're so productive, especially because your family may be sending in that work. Ron, if you're writing for Montgomery, it is a certainty that wives and children will read your blog, send it into the prison because it's a larger prison. And they're going to say, why aren't you like Ron? If Ron's doing this, why aren't you? So Ron's going to have to be prepared while he's walking to the chow hall or walking around the track to be called aside from a guy who's been in prison for 15 years and say, why are you writing this about your time here? I'm giving a different message to my family. These are things he's going to have to prepare for, which is high risk, a little higher reward. And I have no doubt Ron will be able to, to respond to that. But these are things that pop up while in prison. And they happened to me. The upside was I was only there a, a year. So by the time people caught on, I was going home. Ron's got a little longer sentence, things you should be thinking about. And of course, number 10, as we discussed, we'll discuss, discuss it again next week, engineering the release plan, which in the coming months will be ubiquitous in the federal prison system. Every federal prisoner, we believe, will be required to create one, to share one, regardless of what you may hear from others. Uh, it's coming. So to the extent that you can lead and create it and share it before you were told to do so, it just shows leadership. And again, we encourage you to share that work with your friends, your family, everyone who has a vested interest in your success. The worst they can do is, uh, is not read it. Uh, who cares? Just keep sending it. With that said, I want to see if there's any questions that we we haven't addressed as we go on one hour on, on the webinar. Someone asked about COVID isolation, quarantine still in effect. Um, some people are still quarantining, though, for very short periods of, uh, of time. Recently, someone surrendered. I think it was to Lompoc with, um, they just had COVID and they surrendered and then they're still, they came or they met someone there in COVID and they sent them to quarantine. So these things are still unhappy. These things are still happening, unfortunately. Someone commented, my son was not allowed to keep his asthma medication. Yeah, those, those are tough. And that's where you have to learn how to advocate, ensure that it's in the probation report, ensure you have letters from physicians. And if he's still not getting the medication he needs, then we may need to bring in experts to help resolve this issue. But as much improvement as we're seeing in the prison system, it doesn't change that healthcare probably isn't, uh, they're, they're not the best at it, so, so to speak. Okay, so we, we just need to push and make sure. Uh, let's see, by the way, some of you may get an upper or lower bunk as disclosed in the probation report. I had an upper bunk. There are some guys that don't want it. If, you're, if you need a lower bunk, that may mean that you may be not as, as desirable housing unit because lower bunks are more desirable. I had an upper bunk, be careful. You can get injured getting up and down. The probation report will really determine even your bunk, your job, your programs, the prison. If you haven't sat for that PSR yet, or even if you have, make sure that it's accurate. We can help you with that if you have questions. Are there any other? Yeah, Scott said bring one week supply and make sure those medications are on the formulary. I said two weeks, fine. Are there any hands up that I'm not answering? Anything that I haven't, anything that I haven't addressed? Any questions that we that we haven't covered? Someone asked, do they let you keep the prescription medications? You will bring them for a little while. You may use your own until you interview with them and go through an intake, and then they will transition you to the medications, which is why you should go through the BOP formulary list. If anyone has any injections or injections to, that was a Freudian slip talking about medication. If anyone has anything to insert based on their experience um, in prison or what they're hearing, we'd, we'd welcome hearing it. Scott said, contacts are not allowed. Thank you. Anyone I'm sorry. You Thank can you. go. Someone asked about a CPAP machine. Yes, you can surrender with a, a CPAP machine. You want to make sure it's in the probation report. 
Yes, we've had people go with a CPAP. Yes, your question. Um, I, I'm new to this Zoom app, so I'm learning, so I apologize. Um, I try to type, I hit on a picture to get down at the bottom like of the screen to chat, and it, I guess you guys don't oh, that's see That's okay. It. We hear you well. Just ask your question. Okay. Um, are ponytail holders allowed to keep your hair up? It's a very good question. I should know the answer, but but I don't. Um, ponytail holders. So I perhaps I would encourage you to do some research. Go okay. to the guide. Go to the commissary list, and the commissary list is going to tell you things that that you could buy, and one of them could be a ponytail holder. My answer would probably be yes. Okay. Uh, because it's considered a necessity, especially for work. Like when you work, you have to have a mask on. Or if you have a beard, you have to cover it up. So I probably, if you're working in the kitchen, it's a hygienic thing, right? So my my thoughts are yes, and the commissary list will probably say that you could purchase them. But I, I'm going to confirm out of curiosity, but I would say yes. They they had rubber bands for male <laughs> prisoners at the camp I was at. Yeah. So I I would imagine they would, but but like Justin said, check the commissary list. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Oh, that too I, is a dis that too is a disciplinary infraction, by the way. If you uh, if you're working in the kitchen and they tell you to put the mask on to cover your beard or mustache and you don't, if they tell you more than once, they're going to write you up. Those are for the people that uh, don't want to shave or have the beard. If you're working in the kitchen, be cognizant of uh, just of everything you're doing. Yes, I I heard someone was going to ask a question. This is Gina. Um, I was just going to say to Jessica that I plan depend. I mean. FCI Dublin and I have printed out the commissary list and I was shocked how much stuff is actually on it like tweezers and makeup like I didn't think I was going to have access to any of that so I would suggest that she goes to whatever BOP commissary list where she's thinking of where she's going to have to surrender and read through it um, it'll give you an idea of what you can buy and have Right. That's why, as we covered six, thank you. That's exactly right. That's why, as we addressed this top 10 list, we focused on looking at the inmate handbook, looking at the commissary. And you're right. You'll be surprised at the things that are available for purchase. It's, it's a pretty, it can be pretty overwhelming, uh, which is a good, which is a good thing. So thank you for commenting. I absolutely agree. Thank you, Gina. Let's see any other, any other questions that, uh, that we have missed is it very rare for the commissary list on the it is very rare for the commissary list on the BOP matches the actual and that's true and also a lot of times things that you want they're out of <laughs> I remember like Scott the day before we shop some prisoners job is to come and post the commissary list and like all these highlights of what they're out of so like you're out of the 17 things that I need <laughs> and that can be based on it didn't get delivered or sometimes Scott, I'd love to learn how they did the commissary shopping at Yankton. Where we shopped, it was based on the cleanliness inspection the prior week. So there were four dorms. So whether you came in first, second, third, or fourth, that's when you'd shop. And a lot of guys would really get neurotic about winning because if you're not first or second, when you go to shop, you're out of so many items. How did they determine commissary shopping at Yankton? Wow, that's that's a really good idea. I'm surprised that that we didn't have something like that. It just I think we were third in the week and that was that was how it was but again similar thoughts you could put a lot on that list and and not get it and i think it's it's just one of the more humbling lessons there be happy you received something but always planning ahead and rationing oatmeal and mackerel and all your weird little things but but being grateful that you have access to at least something yeah the the, the cleanliness inspection was a big deal when i was in prison i mean guys would really uh take that seriously for a number there's pride in winning and being clean you also get some extra treats that night for movie night but the biggest part of it was the ability to shop first or second in the commissary uh, let's see someone commented on someone being home for a long time i followed the rules expected the staff to follow the rules too including visitation yeah that's true i mean there's sometimes a rules for thee and not for me or whatever that phrase is there during COVID, there were people that were reprimanded for not wearing a mask and the guard wasn't wearing a mask or there wasn't enough there wasn't sanitation and soap in the showers and, and it's a frustrating it's prison and even though there's improvement and it's becoming more reform-minded it doesn't change that it that it's prison and you might not always get the treatment or what you need even if you follow the rules and um 
as we like to say, more to come, more frustration, more crisis to come. But to the extent that you can prepare for it, you won't be disappointed. And not let them get a rise out of you if you respond inappropriately. I mean, that was that was a goal of mine. I filmed a YouTube video earlier today where this one guard liked to ring the fire alarm at three, three o'clock in the morning. And I, he worked, he, he, he admitted he found working in the camp very boring. He liked working in the higher security prison. And he would do this fire alarm at three o'clock and it could be 30 degrees and we're all standing outside <laughs> half naked because you have three minutes to get out there banging on your lockers. And he used to enjoy that. He, he used to enjoy the way that some people kind of complained about it and the way that and he, and I said, I wasn't going to let that happen. So just to understand there's some more frustration to come. That said, any questions? Uh, any questions we haven't answered? I've got one. Yes. As far as surrendering, what's a good time to surrender? Because I know if I got shift change, you got child time to late, you might have to stay overnight and wait for the next day to get all processed in. How we, does that we, we encourage people, even if your letter says 12, 1 or 2 o'clock to get there by 10 o'clock in the morning, which enables you to get there early before shift change. It enables you to get processed in and, and over to the to the to the camp or, or to the compound a little earlier in the day. So perhaps you can spend some time in the afternoon in the library or track, have your first meal in the chow hall. Some people who have gotten there too late or even at the desired starting time will can end up spending the night in the hole because they didn't process you in in time. So we'd say get there by 10 o'clock in the morning, drive slowly around the prison. A lot of cops, especially where I served time, it was like a 25 mile dirt road to get there. And there was a lot of a lot of a ticket, a lot of cops waiting to give tickets in these prison towns. So get there on time, drive slowly, plan it out, have money ready to get onto your books, surrender with your contact list, have your release plan, uh, let your family know that you'll be calling. There's a very good chance that core links invitation will end up in your spam mail. Be aware of that. So these are just basic protocols, logistics. We want to help, we want to make sure you understand before you go in. Awesome, appreciate that. You're welcome. Uh, presuming, is there ever a situation where you can shop at the commissary your first day? I've actually known someone to shop at the commissary their first day. They got there early. They surrendered with cash and they shopped that afternoon because it was that dorms day. So it has happened. Uh, usually it's within a few days. Uh, some commissaries, prisons, I served in a place where you could shop twice a week. Some prisons, it's most prisons, it's only once a week, but I have seen that, which I think is a good thing. There's also going to be guys that will, there could be a, Scott, like when you went to Yankton, was there a little welcome kit for you in the, when you went to the, did they, I mean, I got a few items. I had three weeks in quarantine, so I didn't shop in commissary until I was there a month. Uh, so there was, there was no welcome kit because everyone up there didn't, didn't have anything. But by the time I got to the camp, uh, there, the people I had met in quarantine had organized some things and helped me. Yeah. So, and, and actually that's right. And earlier Scott said, no contact. Some prisons might not allow it. You know, some do. So I do want to clarify that. I served time in a prison where guys had contacts again, have it in the PSR, bring them. The worst they can say is you, you cannot bring them there. There's no, there's no downside in that. Okay. Let's see. If there aren't any other questions that we didn't answer, we can wrap up and I'll close with uh, next week, we are gonna bring John Gustin back on. And I just wanna get up updates on COVID with the CARES Act ending, what he's hearing with jobs and the halfway house and employment is the 25% gonna come back. What will that mean for those of you who wanna work from home? If you don't have an established business, will they allow it? What type of credentials or what should you have created when you go to the halfway house to ensure that they approve the job? And so it's it's time to have that update with him with COVID ending, and we're going to have that uh, we're going to have that interview with John next week. Okay. Okay. Good. I wish all of you a wonderful Thursday. Thank you again for contributing to our community. I'll send out this replay in a couple of days, along with all of the resources we mentioned: the BOP formulary list, the top ten surrender, everything we've referenced in this webinar. We'll send out. So thank you all for contributing. Thanks, everybody. Okay.